السيدات والسادة الحضور في المؤتمر ومن هم خلف الشاشات Your Excellencies Distinguished Guests Ladies and Gentlemen نرحب بكم مرة أخرى في الجلسة الثانية للمؤتمر الدولي لتقويم التعليم والتدريب تجويد نواتج التعليم ودعم النمو الاقتصادي الذي تنظمه هيئة تقويم التعليم والتدريب بالشراكة مع الأمانة السعودية لمجموعة العشرين It's our pleasure to welcome you again in the second thematic session of the International Conference on Education and Training Evaluation, Improving Learning Outcomes and Supporting Economic Growth, organized by the Education and Training Evaluation Commission in partnership with the G20 Saudi Secretariat. الجلسة الثانية للمؤتمر بعنوان تقويم واعتماد برامج التعليم والتدريب التقني والمهني يرأس الجلسة معالي الدكتور عبد الله أبو اثنين نائب وزير الموارد البشرية والتنمية الاجتماعية للعمل. The second session is titled Assessing and Accrediting Technical and Vocational Education and Training Programs. The session is chaired by Dr. Abdullah Abu Thnein, Vice Minister of Human Resources and Social Development for Labor. فليتفضل معاليكم مشكورا. Please welcome His Excellency. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Peace be upon you all. May you all have a good uh, day. And I'd like to mention that there is interpretation from Arabic to English uh, and vice versa. I would like to welcome uh, you all to this important session about assessing and accrediting technical and vocational education and training. It's my great pleasure to moderate this very important session today. I also would like to thank the organizers for selecting such an important and timely topic that concerns all of us, as it has a major impact in business and economic development and in the outcomes of, for the labor market and its participants. The quality of TVIT is integral to advanced labor markets that seek to satisfy the changing demands of today's employers. The pressure of increasing unemployment globally and the need to maintain a capable workforce has made the quality of TVIT programs increasingly relevant. Throughout this session, our international experts and national experts will analyze different national approaches to accreditation and assessment and other related issues such as skill, de skill development and uh, apprenticeship programs and will discuss some innovative ways with which digital technologies can help. We are fortunate today to have six leading experts in the field who come from a variety of different organizations and countries. From the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, we are, the, we are joined by TPTC Governor, His Excellency Dr. Ahmed al fahed Deputy Minister of Labor Matters, Dr. Ahmed Zahrani, and Executive Manager of the National Center for assessment and accreditation, Mr. Mohammed Al Asiri. From around the globe, we welcome the UNESCO specialist, Mr. Horimishi Katayama, a former education policy specialist of New Zealand, Mr. Josh Williams, and head of evaluation and research for skills development Scotland, Dr. Patrick Watt. We are so excited and looking forward to their presentations and remarks. Each speaker has 15 minutes to make his presentation, followed by five minutes for questions and clarifications. Viewers are invited to send their questions for a 25 minutes open session at the end, and they can send their question through the chat function. We will have live translation from Arabic to English and from English to Arabic throughout the session. The first speaker today is His Excellency Dr. Ahmed al fahed his Excellency Dr. Ahmed al fahed is the governor of the Technical and Vocational Training Corporation in Saudi Arabia. Previously, he has worked as the Deputy Minister for International Affairs at the Ministry of Labor. He also had, has held many other positions in TPTC and other organizations. Dr. Ahmed holds a PhD in mechanical, mechanical engineering from Old Dominion University. Dr. Ahmed will talk about TPTC's transformation strategy to link TVIT with labor market needs. Without further uh, ado, uh, Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed, the floor, is, the floor is yours. 
شكرا دكتور عبد الله السلام عليكم Thank you دكتور عبد الله peace be upon you all uh, I'm going to speak in Arabic and the presentation will be in English so in order to enrich the discussion and the speech as mentioned by His Excellency Dr. Abdullah, we are going to speak about the transformation that we are having in TVTC in Saudi Arabia, uh, given that the, uh, to be based on the demands, not only what we receive in terms of inputs. Also, I would like to uh, thank the uh, ETEC for their organization of this important conference. We need similar conferences in order to enrich our work there is transformation in the methods of teaching and learning and the COVID crisis that impacted a lot on our ways of work. So we always need to remind ourselves of these things. As an introduction to the topic, I would like to uh, Can I have the next slide? Uh, we're going to speak about why do we speak about the need for transformation? It is known that in the recent years, there was there were rapid rapid changes in many skills and jobs, uh, and this led to having a great need for the change and transformation in the ways and methods of teaching and training. Also, the uh, fourth industrial revolution and what happened after that revolution in terms of the 5G uh for communication so we have some skills that we call 5g demands for skills and some skills are known and some other skills need to be rethought of so we have a quick uh glimpse of the youth we have 1.3 billion uh global youth population aged between 15 to 24 this is a big number and we uh it's considered 13.6 percent of them are unemployed and 20% are need, not employed in, or in education or training. So, and also we have some uh, 41 million of people. And we have also, uh, speaking about women, women uh, also uh, need to be in work. We will have a lot of work to be provided and in order to uh, face and tackle these challenges that we are facing. There are three international uh, agencies, the G20, the UNESCO, and the OECD. We, They were speaking about these challenges, and they said that uh, youth today need some uh, set of skills, not only one skill, because the requirements of the work market are now different. Uh, the TVTC will give them these skills. They will equip, equip them with multiple skills, improve their employment perspectives, prospects, and economic contributions. Also, there's another point that, as I mentioned before, there is a lot of dialogue about uh, the different needs of the work market. And we're speaking about the uh, upskilling of the vet. 50% uh, require either uh, upscaling or rescaling, and this is clear. In Saudi Arabia, all praise to Allah, we have wise leaders who exert a lot of efforts. And as His uh, Royal Majesty said, education is a fundamental pillar by which aspirations of the peoples of our Islamic nation towards progress, prosperity, development, and civilized advancement in knowledge and useful sciences are fulfilled. Also, the Crown Prince, Prince Mohammed Salman, said, We will not rest until our nation is a leader in providing opportunities for all through, uh, through education and training and high quality services such as employment initiatives, health, housing, and entertainment. So, this urged us to work hard under this vision of our leaders. For those from outside Saudi Arabia, what are the uh, descriptions of TVET in Saudi Arabia? Uh, it is free. Uh, for both males and females across all regions in the kingdom. Uh, and it is spread all over the kingdom in all the regions. Saudi Arabia is a big country, uh, like, and it is in all uh, governorates. Also, it is diverse in terms of specializations and fields. As for the main pillars of TVTC strategic objectives, we have four main pillars. The first one is the national orientation, uh, 
uh, Vision 2030. We also have the uh, TVET that has uh, our uh, clear directions related to the big projects that we're having in Saudi Arabia. These are uh, pillars that are considered important for our TVTC work. Also, we have the UNESCO strategy for the TVT sector all over the world. And also we have a lot of evidence that uh, we benefited from. The G20 policies as well, uh, we have a lot of ads and advertisements for the leaders and the ministerial that talk about how to conform TVTC with the importance and the needs of the work market. Also, the World Economic Forum, which is very important, uh, they mentioned a lot some of these points. So we benefited from all of these four pillars. We launched some strategic initiatives, more than 60 initiatives. Uh, we call them as waves, wave one, wave two, wave three. Some of them are complete. Some of them are under uh, development. Some of them will be uh, happening soon. Uh, out of that, I, I want to mention, because the time is limited, I will only limit myself to speaking about some specific of them. We also uh, had conformity and alignment between our own inputs according to TVTC public st general strategy and also the international uh, benchmarks and the national transformational program of 2020 and other programs Saudi Arabia. So we come up with some of the vision and mission and descriptions of our uh, work. And also we have a lot of changes uh, that we are facing and we need to be as agile, as flexible as possible in order to face the requirements of the work market. And we need a uh, high capability of uh, trainers and experts. We need to have strong relations with and partnership with the labor market. We need quality of the trainees services also because quality is important. And we're now uh, in this house of expertise in terms of quality. Also sustainable financing and spending efficiency. This is very important. Also uh, in one page about our uh, corporation, we have more than 220 colleges and institutions for males and females all over Saudi Arabia. We have 200,000, more than 200,000 trainees in our colleges and uh, institutions. Also, we supervise the private institutions. We have more than 1,000 private uh, institutions all over the world, uh, all over the kingdom. So what happened during the last three years? We uh, had a lot of growth in terms of 2017. We had a number of trainees, 150,000. And then we have more than 236. Now it is more than 241,000 trainees. This is very important. Also the 2030 vision of Saudi Arabia, we have a lot of important things that were happening, not just in quantity, but in quality as well. We also have job opportunities for TVTC graduates. Uh, we are not only working on qu uh, quantity, but also the job opportunities uh, in addition to the expansion of our programs. Uh, according to our uh, agreements, we during COVID-19, we could find more than uh, 19,000 uh, job opportunities, and we will work on providing one job opportunity for all graduates, for every graduate. Uh, so we, we we want jobs for all of our graduates. Uh, these are some other initiatives like Riyadh, Riyadh, which is entrepreneurship, uh, which is very important. And in the near future, we will have SMEs uh, aspects of work and because they will contribute to our economic situation. So this is uh, 2019 statistics about short courses, workshops, lectures. Also, we will continue working on that. Also, Riyadh uh, partnership with our uh, partners and we could uh, finance a number of uh, projects with a total funding amount of 1 billion, 4,000, uh, and we have 4,889 uh, SMEs with a cost of 1 billion Saudi Riyal. Also, some of our programs are flexible training programs because we consider that there is now a huge change in terms of the uh, issues of education training. Uh, than before in terms of the long time of training and the other things. Now there are different needs. We need to be flexible 
in order and it, this flexibility need to be controlled not uncontrolled we need it to be effective and contributed to the economy of our country and these are programs that we are working on now in order to uh, depend on international standards and international benchmarks we also have strategic partnerships and these are one of the uh, most successful uh, programs we have 28 successful partnerships with in different fields we have 10 main ones like tourism and hospitality which is very important food industry transportation and logistic services entertainment power electricity and water industrial services these are important uh, fields also oil and gas construction oil and gas is very important in Saudi Arabia also the sector of uh, mining communication and information technology these are uh, aspects and we have other sectors and we have other strategic partners in order to have greater participation from the private sector uh, these are technical colleges we have 38 technical colleges which is considered the Training starting with education, not ending with education. We don't have training with uh, uh, goals without identifying the needs of the market and the job opportunities. Then we have a board of director uh, by the private sector, not the education sector. The education sector participates with us in terms of finance and uh, quality assurance and quality control. But also we have other uh, training services because those private sectors are no more about the uh, future uh requirements and the scale forecasting is very important in order to know what is be going to be needed for every uh, sector also another important thing is that we have employment agreement with different stakeholders and partners like uh, speaking about uh, military services and uh, te telecommunication and others uh, like oil and gas uh, for example, we have Saudi Aramco, which is one of the biggest in the world. We have agreements with them in order to expand these kinds of uh, partnerships. We have also big projects like NIOM, uh, Al Giddiya, other programs uh, with the uh, head of HRDF, Human Resources Development Fund, as well. My time is over. I will uh, conclude. There are some of the programs, and now I will conclude with uh, this visit that. Uh, by His Royal Highness the Crown Prince, to one of our strategic, the Saudi Technical Strategic for Railway, he said, together we will continue building a better country, fulfilling our dream of prosperity and unlocking the talent, potential, and dedication of our young men and women. Thank you for listening and peace be upon you all. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this fruitful presentation. Uh, I like a lot what you spoke about in terms of linking the strategy, the strategy of your corporation to the 2030 vision of the kingdom, so that it will be supporting to the industry, the and SMEs in this field. Also, and this, I have a question about the strategic partnerships. How? How much do they represent in terms of the corporation? Thank you, Your Excellency, Doctor. There is no doubt that I consider this as um, an important direction to uh, go through. With the decision of the Council of Ministers, number 17, the National Center for Strategic Partnerships was established, and we support this direction. And we aim at uh, establishing more and more partnerships. We now have some targets. These targets are built on the needs and the vision of the Saudi Arabia. And we uh, could uh, do more than we uh, plan. And I think that every country has its own needs. We don't have one size fit all solutions. We have mega projects and uh, speaking about some other countries, we benefited a lot from some other countries like German con countries speaking in German and others. But we do have strengths in some mega companies like public companies or other uh, private companies and we found that these kinds of, of partnerships are very helpful and uh, they have strong growth in Saudi Arabia. Also I'd like to mention that training in these partnerships and these colleges uh, is done through 
an international service provider. For example, we needed some help in terms of digging uh, technologies. We received some help from other accredited uh, parties internationally, and we supervised their work. Soon we will uh, have more than 40 partnerships. This is a challenge during the crisis, but in co in, through our cooperation with other partners, we will be able to do our work. We have cooperation with the uh, Human Resources Development Fund, Ministry of Labor, and other agencies and partners from uh, chambers of commerce and others. We will be able to achieve our goals. And we reached 29% uh, of our colleges are international partnerships. We need to uh, reach 40% soon. Thank you, Doctor. I'd like to remind the participants that they can send their questions through the uh, Q&A uh, option. We will have 25 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Dr. Ahmed Zahrani is our next speaker. He is the Deputy Minister for Labor Matters at the Ministry of Human Resources and Social Development. He has 20 years of experience in public and private sector. The speaker speaking in English. Advisory and administrative position. He joined the Institute of Public Administration as a faculty member in 1996, where he served many uh, roles at IPA, ranging from key administrative roles to academic posts. He has also worked with the several government organizations in key uh, positions, such as economic and finance department head, and also served as the director of business center, where he was responsible to innovate, develop, and com commercialize IBA uh, intellectual services. More recently, he is the chair of the G20 Employment Group uh, and the Deputy Labor Market Matters. Uh, before that, he was serving as a senior advisor for strategy and research in the Capital Market Authority, uh, CMA. Uh, Dr. Ahmed holds a PhD in finance from uh, Pronell University in the UK. Uh, Dr. Ahmed will, will talk about labor market uh, reforms uh, skill pillars in the labor market strategy. Uh, we invite Dr. Ahmed uh, to introduce his presenta presentation. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, well, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ahmed, and um, since I prepared my presentation in English, uh, allow me to uh, speak in English. I hope the presentation can be shown in the screen now and everybody can see it. So um, uh, let's start with uh, just a uh, light like start. Um, we know uh, it's the talk of, uh, let's say, everybody interested in education and labor market and skills that robots are taking over. But uh, the reality is we still uh, not that far, not that uh, level. We still have many manual jobs. We still have many chores and many responsibilities that we need to take care of. So the idea is that uh, this is, yes, something coming in the future but we need to anticipate it, we need to embrace it and understand it and see how that might impact either the supply side, the education and trading, or also the demand side or the labor market. Uh, in general, my uh, presentation today will be uh, tackling many issues, will focus more on the skill issues. I have been honored this year to chair the employment working group in the G20 where we work closely with um, the G20 members and uh, guest countries, and also with international organizations like ILO, OECD, the World Bank. So in my presentation, you will see some analysis from those uh, international organizations and also some updates on what we've been doing in the employment working group for the, the Saudi presidency uh, 2020, where we concluded our uh, ministerial meeting last uh, month and uh, announce our um, employment ministerial declaration. Let me start also with the main messages and let's say the takeaway of this presentation. 
uh, I uh, prefer to start with it, not to leave it toward the end. So um, just to make sure that the messages go through. We all know that uh, labor market is more dynamic. We know labor market is, uh, uh, has a lot of interaction with the education and with the industry, with the revolutions. So that pose also challenge and opportunities for all of us. Uh, many countries also around the world are looking to implement uh, strategies that improve both employment prospect, especially with the focus of the young women and men, and also the productivity of uh, the enterprise, because this is a key issue. Uh, a central to uh, both these outcome is a solid foundation of the core skill as a key factor for employability. Uh, along with these policies, of course, there are many supporting uh, and uh, programs related to education, uh, availability of training opportunities, the motivational and the behavioral aspect, and also the ability to support and take advantage of opportunities for continuous uh, learning. This is also in line with uh, the social protection coverage policies. Uh, this policy should be empowering people to look for opportunities and to move between jobs and to move as His Excellency Dr. Ahmed mentioned that maybe self-employment, uh, this is very key issue in the policy. Uh, also in the G20 uh, um, employment working group, I will give you update on the social protection and the youth uh, roadmap. In general, as we know globally, um, if you see the chart on the left uh, side, the bottom left side, Unemployment for youth usually is three to four times unemployment of other working uh, uh, age groups. So this is very alarming. Also, as Dr. Ahmed also mentioned, that uh, need uh, is still um, a problem, especially when we go to um, female. So 30% of young women globally are not in education, employment, nor training, and 12% for uh, young men. Also, 77% uh, of young workers are in informal employment. And with this comes a lot of issues like the social protection, the rights, and the empowerment for those people in the informal sector. Uh, yes, uh, some job we could say uh, might uh, disappear. And if you can see uh, on the screen in front of you, uh, that this is the share of the job by risk of uh, automation from different countries around the world. And the blue um, uh, color is the high risk of automation. Uh, also, we, we see uh, in the global scene that industrial jobs are, of course, falling in the West, but is still rising in the East. So, the story is not consistent, it's not the same around the globe. Each country has its own locality and labor market issues. So this is something that we need to be aware of. Uh, also, uh, the technological uh, changing is also taking uh, jobs, uh, let's say, uh, more into uh, the intensive uh, in non-routine cognitive task. So non-routine cognitive task related to, let's say, PR and other related jobs. So these jobs need to be uh, considered as uh, high risk also. Uh, and the supply side, uh, we know, and people here are more expert than me in the education, but we all know that uh, years of schooling are not the same as learning. And uh, the average year of schooling is uh, to be unadjusted and adjusted for the learning is different concept. So if we adjust it by the test score, we see different segment and we see more, um, let's say less effective years in each country. Also, uh, many countries don't know uh, whether students are learning. So this is the percentage of countries in each region with a nationally representative uh, learning center. Um, we have here five categories of geographical countries, and you see the percentage of learning assessment uh, center nationally. Uh, in the labor market uh, related uh, issues, uh, we know um, 
there is a still um, shortage in cognitive and social skills. Once you see the chart is above zero, it, um, it represents uh, an index of shortage. So the plus here is shortage, the minus is uh, surplus. You can see in many countries, there is a shortage in reasoning abilities, in the complex problem solving, in the social skills. And as we know, these are very integral, especially in many kinds of jobs that we anticipate uh, in the future. Also, uh, the adult uh, uh, learning is, uh, when we say training, is not always reaching to those at highest risk. So for example, workers in fully automated jobs, they get four times less job-related uh, training and 30 hours per year less training. Uh, and the adequate social uh, protection, uh, there are uh, very important, let's say, principles for the social protection, especially when it covers the non-standard work. When we say non-standard work, we uh, talk about range type of uh, employment types. We're talking about self-employment. It could be gig economy. It could be uh, app or platform employment, or it could be uh, uh, different types of, let's say, flexible work. These kind of non-standard uh, work usually uh, they are not very well covered in terms of policy and outreach in terms of social protection. So any scheme of uh, social protection should care of uh, the incentive of misclassification of workers, and it should reach to high coverage among non-standard worker and does not lead to uh, more adverse selection in terms of, let's say, companies uh, or firms find ways of uh, hiring people not into the system. And it should be, of course, affordable for um, contribution. There are many countries around the world that are experimenting with, let's say, um, universal basic income. And the idea here is that you need to give people, let's say, the minimum coverage so they could uh, re, uh, reduce the risk of being out of the market or reduce the risk or incentivize them to look for more opportunities. Uh, let's say uh, some of the key uh, policies that we've been discussing in, over the years in the employment working group, and this is basically the best practices around the countries. Improve, uh, one is improving core skill. We think this is very important to the labor market comes with that also the better skill anticipation. Without anticipation, we cannot really know how the market will change and how that could feed into the education and also the training curriculum. Uh, also strengthening adult learning where we provide lifelong learning. So it's an opportunity for current worker or out of the job to uh, adjust, readjust to the market and uh, take the learning that is relevant to their skills. Adequate social protection is also very important to cover, and I already covered that in the previous slide. Uh, number five, effective active labor market policies, where the, uh, labor market policy should look into the job seekers, unemployed, and provide different uh, policy solutions to activate them to be in the labor market comes with that also supporting uh, policies when we talk about, let's say, regional and sectorial uh, policies. Uh, in the G20 Employment Working Group, uh, we had three interesting priorities this year. The first one was a focus on youth and their transition to work. The second one is the social protection. And the third one, exploring behavioral insight application for labor market uh, policies. Briefly, I will give you just a brief of what's our outcome uh, this year. And the youth, um, as we know, we do have um, leaders' uh, commitment to reduce youth at risk by 15% by 2025. It happens in Saudi presidency, we are midterm. So uh, we agreed with the countries to come up with youth uh, roadmap. We call it G20 Youth Roadmap until 2025 comes with that a lot of uh, many policy options and agreement on the definition of youth, definition of youth at risk, 
I'm talking about unified definition among G20s, and also how we are uh, monitoring our progress toward those commitments. In the second uh, priority, there is a commitment to correct classification of worker to support access to adequate social protection and also establish data collection to reflect changing pattern of work or what they call new form of work and also on the reporting uh, format in our plan of self-report that each country has to make it clear. And also we agreed on many policy options for uh, better social protection. Uh, regarding the third priority, we agreed with the countries to establish uh, the G20 Behavioral Insight Knowledge Exchange Network, and this will be operated by the Riyadh Behavioral Insight Center. Basically, we're saying there is another layer of policy making where we look into the behavioral, the biases, um, the barrier in front of whether job seekers or employ employees or employer of how to um, absorb information, how to make decision, and how to be um, relevant and close to the labor market. Here we agreed that we will start um, exchanging knowledge and experience and build to improve uh, our policies. Uh, in the Saudi context, uh, finally, this is the last part of my presentation. Um, this is the Human Capital Index by the World Bank Group, and we can say Saudi in the high uh, income uh, countries category, but we still we have opportunity to increase our productivity uh, and our human capital index. Also, uh, this is the effective years of schooling. Saudi comes in around 8.4 uh, years out of the 12 years. So there is a room of improvement there. Of course, this is adjusted by the test scores. And uh, finally, um, we conducted what we call a massive survey, three LMS, three labor market survey, where we conducted a massive survey on employers, employees, and HR experts. These are some of the type of difficulty of hiring either Saudi men and women. Attitude toward work is still an issue, and we think there is an opportunity to improve uh, over there among other issues, of course. Uh, finally, I would like just to remind everyone that Saudi is going through a massive change. We do have Vision 2030. Out of the Vision, there is National Transformation Program. We do have maybe three or four relevant, relevant objectives, female participation, and we already, in the last quarter, we achieved a jump to more than 30% participation. And I think this is something very worth uh, mentioning. Um, a few years ago, we used to be 17. So we think we are on the right track in there. We do have global talent as an objective to recruit global talent, to increase uh, the know-how in the market, and also to improve the working condition. Recently, another program has been also approved, the Human Capability Program, where it's aimed to develop citizens that are able to complete to compete globally and build uh, basic skills for the future. Uh, lastly, recently also we uh, uh, at the ministry, we were leading labor market strategy where it was approved. In that strategy, we have a whole pillar on skills and uh, values and mindset. And there are many um, uh, initiatives that will be co-owned uh, by the ministry and other ministries like Ministry of uh, Education and other ministries. One of them is aligning uh, labor market education and training and also occupational and skill uh, planning through, of course, sectorial uh, board and uh, through participation of the private sector as well. I reached to the conclusion of uh, my presentation and I'd like to thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this uh, informative uh, presentation, and you finished uh, on time. Uh, I have just one uh, follow-up question. You mentioned the uh, human capital development programs, uh, one of the Vision 2030 uh, programs. Also, you mentioned the recent changes in the uh, structure of the labor market. So wouldn't you think uh, you know, labor market strategy uh, and skill pillar 
will have uh, effect uh, uh, and achieve its uh, objectives. How uh, how uh, far your strategy go? Uh, thank you, Your Excellency. Well, uh, regarding the strategy, it has been approved uh, recently, and now we are working in detailing out uh, um, the uh, initiatives themselves and starting uh, initiating those uh, projects. We anticipate for the labor market strategy Mainly it aims until 2025. So you could say is a midterm uh, national uh, uh, strategy, but we anticipate also during the 2021, we see the uh, inauguration or the um, establishment of some of the sectorial board. We already uh, also launched what we call a workforce development plan. We conducted a workshop recently with many um, organization, uh, ETEC was there, TBTC, and Ministry of Education, Ministry of um, uh, Economy. So we think the work has already started. Of course, these um, kind of uh, domain, usually it takes time until you see the impact. That's why we divide it into, into different time zones. So some of them we need to realize recent and quick. Some of them might take until 2025 and beyond. Uh, thank you. Uh, have received some of the uh, viewers' questions that we will uh, read at the uh, end of the discussion. I encourage other viewers to send their uh, their questions. Uh, now we will move to uh, to uh, uh, one of our international uh, experts, uh, Mr. Hiromichi Katayama, uh, who is uh, who works at the section uh, of youth. Uh, literacy and skills development at the UNESCO headquarters in Paris. He has been working on strengthening evidence-based of UNESCO strategy for technical and vocational education and training. He has been coordinating the development of skills assessment and anticipation in the Middle East and North Africa region and TVIT management information system in Sub-Saharan Africa. He has also coordinated the implementation of situation analysis of TVIT system in Asia and Africa. Before joining the UNESCO headquarters, he worked at the OECD in Paris on analysis of financial literacy of the program for international students assessment and at the UNESCO Institute of Statistics on Montreal on the analysis and dissemination of education data and indicators. He will be uh, talking about qualification development and the use of big data analytics. Uh, we invite you, uh, Mr. Horishimi Katayama, to uh, take the floor. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, His Excellency, for your introduction and for inviting me to this uh, important conference. And uh, uh, yes, as you mentioned, uh, I, we, we have been working a lot uh, to support the uh, UNESCO member states uh, for the uh, conducting the situation analysis, skills forecasting, skills anticipation, and uh, using the results of skills anticipations, we are helping our member countries to develop the uh, Tibet policy, the uh, development of the Tibet policy and its implementation. So I have a, a lot, lo lot, lot of things that we can uh, that, that we can share with you. But uh, in consultation with your secretariat. Uh, we have decided to uh, focus on the uh, qualification development and also the use of big data analytics. And uh, I must say that uh, we are still under the pilot testing uh, stage or field testing stage. And uh, we have not yet uh, uh, reached to uh, the uh, conclusion and uh, we have not, uh, not, not in the stage of the dissemination of our experiences. But uh, today in my short presentations, I am going to share with you uh, what UNESCO is doing and what kind of new initiatives we are, we are trying to do with our, uh, to support our member states. So uh, let me open my uh, presentation. Yes, I hope you can see it. Yeah, so um, first of all, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about this qualifications development and uh, this is also in line with the uh, UNESCO Tibet policy, uh, uh, sorry, UNESCO Tibet strategy. And uh, as one of the priority action of the UNESCO Tibet strategies, we are trying to support our member states to facilitate 
the debate on recognition of skills and the qualifications, in, including the uh, cross-border mobility of the workers, uh, I mean, between countries and countries. And also the, uh, uh, to, to help our, our member countries to develop the uh, learning pathways in a lifelong learning perspectives. Uh, I mean, we are the education specialists, so we tend to focus on the uh, school to work transition. But at the same time, we think that the work to work transition is important. And, uh, uh, you know, our individual uh, workers uh, may change their jobs in the labor market and that uh, he or she may receive some additional trainings after finishing their formal education programs. And uh, our, our interest is how to support, how to facilitate this work to work transition and the lifelong learning uh, in terms of Tibet. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, short background of the uh, qualification uh, uh, development. And uh, we have been uh, conducting a number of activities at the uh, international levels and also the national and regional levels. And uh, at the global levels, we, uh, uh, we, are, we are trying to develop the uh, international tools on recognition of skills and the qualifications, uh, which we call it World Reference Levels Tools. And I'm going to explain it uh, later after this slide. And also we, are, we, we have been uh, uh, publishing the resources and also the publications uh, with other partners, uh, which include the uh, inventory of national qualifications framework and also the international handbook of learning outcomes. So these uh, materials are available on our website uh, so that you can use it. And also, uh, as I briefly mentioned, uh, we are uh, helping some of our member states to conduct the skills forecast, skills foresight, uh, more qualitative, and also the skills anticipation work. And uh, at the uh, national and regional levels, uh, uh, based on the request that we received from our member countries, we are helping them to uh, uh, strengthen their own qualification system. And also the, uh, we are trying to ensure the alignment with their national qualification systems with the regional, uh, regional organization and the regional qualifications frameworks. And uh, we have been working so far with the ASEAN, Southeast Asian organizations, European Commission, SADC in Southern Africa, and also uh, CARICOM, the Caribbean countries. Um, as far as I know, uh, we haven't really worked, uh, worked with the uh, organization uh, based in the uh, Middle East or uh, Gulf countries, but uh, we are working very closely with the ETF, European Training Foundation, and they are working a lot in the uh, EU uh, neighborhood countries, including the South, uh, southern side of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so uh, let me briefly talk about the uh, global inventory of national qualifications framework. So we are, uh, we are publishing this global inventory in every two years. And uh, the uh, latest uh, available report is uh, published in 2019. Uh, you can find it on our website. And uh, we are now preparing a new uh, 2021 version of the uh, Global Inventory of National Qualifications Framework in partnership with the, uh, uh, these three organizations. You see the logo at the top of my slide, the European Training Foundation, CEDEFOP, and also UNESCO. And uh, we are covering uh, more than 150 countries of the world, uh, which has developed the National Qualifications Framework. And uh, we are trying to identify some uh, 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 commonalities and also differences uh, across those qualifications frameworks. But we have so far identified the common conceptual basis of almost all uh, national qualifications frameworks. And uh, one thing uh, which is significant about this uh, NQF is uh, this is the comprehensive frameworks. So it includes the all types of qualifications, not only the formal uh, uh, the qualifications obtained from the formal education systems, but also from the non-formal education and the informal uh, education. And uh, we would like to support this from the uh, lifelong learning perspective, as I mentioned earlier. And also, uh, we would like to promote the country to use uh, NQF qualifications framework to support the recognition and validation of uh, non-formal learning of the uh, individual learners. And uh, the uh, national qualification framework influence quality assurance uh, systems and also strengthening the uh, focusing on learning outcomes. And also quality assurance may be, uh, quality assurance systems of each country uh, may be integrated in the national qualification uh, framework systems of each country. 
And uh, as I mentioned uh, briefly, uh, there are several uh, regional qualifications framework established in uh, Europe, Southern Africa, Caribbean countries, and also this British Commonwealth countries and uh, Southeast Asia. So we would like to ensure the alignment uh, of the national qualifications framework with this uh, regional framework. And uh, 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 there is a, a new trend uh, regarding the uh, uh, emerging uh, use of the digital credentials. And uh, I think this uh, makes sense, especially at the time of the COVID crisis, because the, uh, many people uh, lost their jobs and uh, they need uh, yeah, they need new employment opportunities. So they may not be able to spend one year or two years to go to Tibet institutions to get the formal qualifications, but uh, they may need a kind of short-term trainings to get some uh, uh, non-formal degrees or digital credential or uh, nano degrees so that they can find a new job. So uh, we'd like to uh, uh, incorporate uh, the trend of this digital credentialing into the national qualifications framework in our member countries. So um, what the UNESCO is trying to provide to the member state is uh, we are trying to set the uh, uh, international norms, global normative instruments, and also the uh, internationally shared uh, hierarchy of level descriptors, uh, which allows comparisons of any kind of learnings assuming that the people are cross, uh, people are moving uh, from one country to another, which makes sense in the context of the Gulf countries. We, we understand that many uh, workers are coming from uh, outside uh, this region to uh, Gulf countries to find a job opportunities. So uh, there should be a kind of uh, 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 comparators uh, uh, for, the, for, the use of the for the use of employers uh, in the Gulf countries uh, uh, when they select the uh, uh, when they select when they hire the uh, workers are coming from uh, outside outside the region and country, and also UNESCO is trying to strengthen the uh, recognition uh, the methodology of recognition of uh, qualifications by developing and also by providing uh, international guidelines and resources, and also uh, we are trying to develop the international tool such as uh, qualification and skills passport, and. Uh, our colleagues in the higher education sections has already uh, established the uh, qualification passport for refugees and the vulnerable migrant, migrants. And uh, this qualification has already been used in some pilot countries. Yes, and uh, this is the uh, main uh, uh, focus uh, of my presentation. And uh, this is uh, one of the example of the uh, solutions to uh, promote the uh, uh, cross-border mobility of uh, qualification and skills. And uh, we have developed uh, the tool, uh, which is called World Reference Levels. And uh, this is a, 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 a tool uh, to allow um, individual learners and also employers and also the national authorities to compare the qualifications obtained by individuals in the different countries and also in different systems. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, when a plumber of uh, country A is traveling to, plum, uh, to the country B, uh, we don't want that workers to uh, go through the uh, training for plumber again in the new countries. And uh, we, instead, we'd like to ensure uh, the, uh, uh, we'd like to create a tool uh, for that uh, uh, mobile workers to use uh, so that he or she can find a job in the new countries without going through the uh, uh, training systems again. And uh, we think that uh, this is also useful uh, uh, for the uh, workers within countries, because usually the uh, uh, more than one systems exist uh, in terms of Tibet within the countries. Uh, we provide a lot of uh, analytical support and the policy advice to our member countries, but uh, unlike the education, uh, education systems, that usually Tibet is provided by uh, multiple ministries. Ministry of Education provides some Tibet. Ministry of Agriculture provides the agricultural Tibet. Ministry of Health provides the uh, health sector related Tibet. And uh, we saw that in some, con uh, some contexts, especially in developing countries, there are no coordination mechanisms across uh, these uh, different uh, training provision systems. So the, uh, uh, the, 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 the tools like the world reference levels may be useful to facilitate the uh, mobility of workers and to facilitate the, uh, the uh, uh, em employers to uh, choose to select the uh, most appropriate 
uh, workers uh, for their companies. You have four or more minutes. Okay, yeah. So quickly, the aim of this uh, world reference level is to uh, translate the outcome-based qualifications, credentials, requirements, job specifications, or framework levels into an international, internationally recognized form of description. Yeah, I'm going to the next slide. Um, so this is the uh, uh, diagram that we are trying to uh, develop. So uh, in short, we are trying to uh, prepare the stand standard profile by including everything uh, which uh, may obtain by the individuals. So this includes the formal qualifications, degree, diplomas, or credential, or badges, uh, which include the, uh, 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 something like a nano degrees, and also the uh, records of non-formal and informal learnings. So we are trying to put everything together into a one profile, and eventually we would like to produce one report so that this, the individual worker can use it to find a job in, in their home countries and also in his new countries. And uh, yes, I would like to stop here uh, because so this is the, uh, 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 the image of the outcomes of this world reference levels. So we have identified 11 key factors which are relevant to the competencies of individuals, which include activities, responsibilities, working with others, quality, skills, and procedures, et cetera. So uh, each individual workers will need to uh, show the supporting documents, which, is, which may be issued by the educational institutions or training institutions. And we are trying to put every, uh, every kind of existing qualification and certificate together to make one uh, single document so that uh, uh, the individual workers can use it uh, uh, for uh, looking for a job. And also this may provide a useful information for the training uh, regarding what kind of training uh, should be provided by the training institutions. So um, as I mentioned, I think the, uh, we are paying attention to the digital credential ecosystems uh, which is emerging. And I think you may have heard the uh, Crucera or MOOCs. And uh, yes, we are trying to pay attention to the, uh, the, the providers, award providers, quality, quality assurance bodies of those, the uh, digital credential, uh, 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 I mean, short-term trainings, and also the nano degree providers, and are trying to incorporate in this the award reference level too. And uh, um, yes, uh, let, let me quickly mention the, uh, from the policy maker's point of view. So those award reference levels are, uh, are used for the uh, uh, individual job seekers and learners, but uh, we are also paying attention to the policy makers and decision makers. So uh, in our tra traditional approach, we are trying to uh, collect the uh, information from the, uh, each ministry, like a labor ministry, private sectors, and also the education ministries, and uh, try to use uh, the uh, existing statistics for uh, policy advice. But uh, we think that uh, this is uh, difficult because the statistics from labor ministries and the statistics from our education ministries are not really comparable. So, and uh, they usually collect the number of workers or number of, uh, num number of graduates by area of studies, but it's really hard to get the uh, information about what kind of skills are needed in the labor market. So I think nowadays uh, we are uh, trying to use the uh, big data, uh, which may uh, be obtained from the uh, online job search portals. And I put the logo of two online job search platforms uh, that I have uh, used in uh, Africa and Asia. So usually uh, these private companies create a platform so that the uh, 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 companies can put, post the uh, job vacancy announcement and also the individual job seekers can uh, post their own CVs data. So we received the uh, big data from those companies and we have analyzed what kind of skills are needed uh, based on the job descriptions posted by the uh, uh, employers, and also what kind of what kind of uh, skills are there in the labor market based on the descriptions of, of the uh, individual uh, job seekers CVs, and then uh, we uh, we uh, yes we have extracted some information about the uh, skills uh, supply and demand in the labor market on a real time basis. So we are still on the pilot basis, but we would like to expand this kind of new approach uh, more and more to our member states. Um, so I, this is my final slide, and uh, our approach is uh, to uh, 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 we will try to use the existing available data, not only the administrative and survey data, but also the uh, 
the uh, big data uh, which may be obtained from our online job search portals uh, for, for, for the use of policy advice and the policy development support to our member countries. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a bit long, but this is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horimichi Kutayama, for this uh, rich and informative uh, presentation. Uh, uh, it's a great effort by the UNESCO. I have uh, one follow-up question uh, about the world uh, reference level. This is a great concept that will facilitate the transferring, uh, you know, skills and uh, people through borders. Uh, how do you collaborate with other uh, international organizations like uh, uh, ILO and uh, other organizations in this in this regard because it's related to migrant workers and and so on. Um, yes, this the world reference level uh, is a very. Uh, we are developing this tool in a very bottom-up approach. So we have invited the individual expert uh, to UNESCO uh, for the development of this tool. But we have shared uh, uh, what we are doing with other development partners, and uh, we have created the interagency working group on Tibet, which include the uh, ILO, uh, European Training Foundation, CEDEFOP, and the European Commissions. So we uh, have an occasional a regular meeting with them and we share our progress with them and we get their feedback and try to incorporate their ideas into our tool. Thank you very much. And we will have more question at the end of, uh, of this uh, session. Sure. Now we thank move you. to, thank you. Now we move to uh, uh, our next uh, speaker, Mr. Josh Williams. Uh, Mr. Williams was formerly uh, Chief Executive of the Industry Training Federation of New Zealand and a Senior Manager in Territory Education Policy at the New Zealand Ministry of Education. Earlier, Mr. Williams was part of the team at the New Zealand Qualifications Authority that developed New Zealand's uh, evaluate, uh, eva evaluative system of quality assurance for the non-university sector. Uh, he will be talking today about uh, e-quality, how digital technology is supporting quality and consistency uh, in VIT. Uh, we invite uh, Mr. Josh Williams uh, to the floor. Uh, thank you, Excellencies. Assalamu alaikum, greetings. It's a pleasure to spend some time with you in the very early hours of the morning here in, in New Zealand. Um, as, as Excellency says, I do my brief for you today is to discuss, I think, what Mr. Katayamu was talking about in terms of some of the new trends uh, that we are seeing with digital assessment, the capturing of informal learning, but in particular, how we in New Zealand have taken a journey over the last decade or so in moving towards a more evaluative system for quality assurance. And in particular, in the COVID crisis that we all face today, how digital technologies are supporting and allowing some of that quality assurance to take place in some quite encouraging ways. So I will just share my screen. Thank you very much. And I, I hope that's coming through for everybody. So as I've mentioned, I will just need to, I think, just contextualize a little bit about the approach that we've taken here, just to, um, uh, I guess, contextualize some of the shifts that I want to talk about. So I think like a lot of countries, uh, you know, the 150 developing qualifications frameworks were obviously interested always in the consistency that happens in respect of that both the quality of our TVET providers, uh, but also the quality and consistency of assessment, especially when it comes to meeting industry standards. And so it was around 10 years ago that here we moved from what was previously a very audit based approach of government um, evaluating the, the inputs uh, to a much more evaluative approach uh, focused on the final two bullet points on the slide, a continuous expectation that our TVET providers self-assess uh, in respect of how well they were delivering education, meeting the needs of their students, meeting the needs of their stakeholders, and to triangulate that self-assessment evidence with a periodic external evaluation conducted by our qualifications authority. 
And I just really want to um, reinforce, because we certainly needed to reinforce it here, uh, that self-assessment doesn't mean uh, that we are not arm's length in terms of quality, and that actually what we are trying to instill in providers is a consistent approach and a culture change, which is about always investigating within an organization, across the organization, how well are we doing and are we meeting the needs and are we achieving the outcomes that we're setting to, to achieve. And I'd like to run for you something that, as Excellency mentioned, um, I, I was involved from the government side at the time. And we obviously, this was a big shift in our system away from thinking about inspectorates and audits and towards a system of trying to instill a culture of self-assessment. And this is the way I liked to describe it then, and it's the way I still like to describe it. So we have people coming uh, from, from the agency to check. And that's an evaluative threat. It's uh, someone is coming, it's, it's, it's scary. And there's, there's a professionally confident way to approach that as a value adding process, to learn new things, to be surprised by something that you might not have seen in your own organization. But you know, the way I described it was you know, that the, the people from our qualifications authority were going to come along to your provider and ask you what, what we have in terms of six key evaluation questions for our providers. And I, I won't read them all, but how well do our students achieve? What is the value of the outcomes? Uh, how do our learning and assessment activities match the needs of those students and relevant stakeholders? And how effectively are students being supported? How effective is the governance and management? And in the end, uh, you know, I think because it's uh, public money, government money, how, how effectively are the important compliances being, being managed? But it, it, for, for me, it was always a bit really important to say, well, look, just imagine that no one is coming. No one is coming to check. And, and you were still this provider and you still had this job in our TVET system around de delivering these skills and outcomes and training, what would you ask yourself? And it turns out, of course, that it's exactly the same questions within an organization. You want to know how well your students are achieving, what is the value of the outcomes for your stakeholders? And so for us, this was a really important point around changing the mindset from our providers who were thinking they were being audited or externally inspected to having an evaluative conversation to discuss how well things were going. Yes, with the agency that had some responsibilities for managing consistency, but more than so we instilled a real quality culture within all of our TVET providers across New Zealand that were delivering vocational education and training. Uh, I also just like to give this um, slightly light hearted example. Um, if I'm in the dentist's chair and the dentist asks me, how often do I floss? The answer is once a day. Uh, the real answer is when I remember. And I think it's really important when we think about the difference between external review and self-assessment, uh, that the real truth is of course, what, what you know to be true for yourself, that I floss when I remember. But when the dentist asks me, I might give quite a different answer. So I think for any quality assurance system in education and training, the notion that an external inspector comes in and always gets the, the very truthful answer about what is actually happening within all of the layers of that organization, uh, that's, you know, it's not necessarily the truth. So this is why I think that self-assessment process is very, very important. That's the primary feature of the system. And as I say, I want to get on to why digital technologies is helping that conversation to be more meaningful. Uh, so, you know, for us, uh, good self-assessment was about embedding uh, the quality processes in and across organizations, that everybody has a responsibility and a role to play in that to define the outcomes uh, and understand about the quality of the products and the services and the leadership that were being delivered within the organization. Uh, and that we really wanted evidence-driven organizations that we did want to be data-driven and make sure that people really knew what was being achieved out there for important stakeholders, particularly the labor market stakeholders, given that vocational education is ultimately about um, a step up for an individual with respect to the labor market 
getting a job, getting a better job, changing jobs. But unless there's a good outcome with respect to an employer, in what sense was it really vocational education and training? And we also saw plenty of examples, and we still do, of, of what's not so good in terms of that self-assessment process. And I've, I've touched on a couple of these points. Uh, when quality is externalized from the organization or just seen as something that the government does to you, uh, that it's something to think about every three to five years when someone is coming, or uh, in a sort of a mediocre sense when quality matters within tertiary providers are seen as a matter for a person who is called the quality assurance manager and they're in an office over there and they have all of the policies that nobody else reads or has much to do with. And as I say, what we saw was, you know, a, 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 that evaluative threat of the, the qualifications authority coming along to check which yes, that's, that's what's occurring, but what are the quality processes that were underpinning that? So at this point, I want to kind of move to the, to the core and, and fast forward to today, and just, I think, to pick up on some of the new trends, both in terms of how organizations are using digital technologies to manage quality themselves, but also I want to move to talk about how the external evaluation process is also being supported through digital and remote eva evaluations necessitated, as I say, by the, the, the COVID period and, and the associated lockdowns. So I think, you know, many of these factors will be familiar to viewers and uh, are happening in a lot of systems around the world. But um, first and foremost, the, these things, the, our devices are certainly making the world of assessment, particularly workplace-based assessment and on-job assessment, uh, rather different. Um, we're no longer separately writing about the skills that are being demonstrated or developed on the job. We are able to deliver content directly to those work sites via those devices, but we are also able to capture evidence of skills development, authenticate that via employers or, or, or assessors, and automatically upload these uh, the, the skill development for the purposes of credentialization. That's helping obviously with centralized um, assessment of digital evidence. So that can again be made more consistent through a, a more centralized approach using digital technologies. That I, I think is, is becoming quite an important convergence, um, particularly for our employers and particularly in terms of the, the question that's been raised in this session already about the capturing of informal learning for the purposes of portability and credentialization uh, for a career change or for redeployment or for recognition of experience or current competencies or prior learning, such that uh, skills that have been gained in some way throughout a career can be captured for that purpose of, of formalizing that learning. Um, and I think the final point that I'd really make just in terms of that digital, uh, the rise of these digital technologies is that I, I see something of a convergence of what we've always described as learning management systems and the way that we collect information about learners into a way that in fact, that combines with an, with an e-portfolio to become something that's direct evidence of skill. So whereas once the best we could do was a certificate a piece of paper with a with a seal on it and a logo and a signature and and that was your proxy for skill now we're able through the use of digital technology to deliver direct evidence of that skill through a learning management system and an electronic portfolio coming together and i think that's going to be a really important conversation for the future of qualifications so we are leading to direct observation of skills again, which uh, supports consistency management processes and the capturing of informal learning, uh, which I think, again, with, with all of the future of work debates, uh, the automation industry 4.0, the augmentation and stackability of skills um, over lifelong learning is something that I think all countries need to take very seriously now. Uh, I want to turn quickly to uh, 
the, the external evaluation and review processes that I mentioned before. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm supported in this by some conversations I have had recently in, in preparation for this conference with, with people currently in our qualifications authority who have recently undertaken uh, external reviews of some of our TVET providers, uh, just like we are right now over Zoom. Um, and what's been really interesting- minutes more. Certainly. What's interesting about that is that while um, it still remains something like an audit process where uh, the evaluators are coming to check, the remote uh, and virtual uh, external evaluation means that it can be a more layered and iterative process. It's not bound by a particular couple of days that the evaluators are coming. And not just that, uh, it even does take away, it seems, some of that external threat of let's go and get all the policies and show them all the paperwork on the table because no one is actually physically coming along to look at that stuff. It really is about a conversation from the evaluators to say, what matters to you? What are your focus areas? What do you think is going well? What do you think is going less well? And so we, it really is about that, that, that learning conversation and something that ought to be a evaluating process rather than a threatening process for that provider. Uh, so look, I will just, I'll end on this slide. Um, and, uh, and literally I won't read this, but just in the case that it proves useful to, to a viewer or, or, or any, any other participant in the conference, one of the things when we developed the system that we heard over and over again was just give us a checklist. And the fact that they were asking that question told us that they hadn't necessarily made the thinking shift. They wanted a tick box process of an audit. Whereas actually what we wanted to do was to have them really reflect and explore and look at the data and get underneath what were the outcomes and how well they were doing. So I will just leave this in, in, on the screen as one of the reports that was prepared at the time that, you know, if someone is looking for a checklist around how to be evaluative within their own TVET organization as a provider to know in their own minds that they're doing a good job, this is a pretty good checklist. Um, so look, thank you again. It's been a, a pleasure uh, to participate in, in ETEC conference. And so Excellency, I, I hand the floor back now. Thank you, Mr. Williams, for this insightful uh, presentation. Uh, it's really interesting uh, to, to look at the self-assessment as you describe it and how people you may uh, you know, misclassify or uh, don't report uh, correctly uh, the information and digital assessment. Do you see a link between uh, self-assessment and digital assessment? Is there uh, now availability of cross-check with other data or sources that can tell the regulators that uh, you know things are not in the right uh, direction or something suspicious. Yeah, look, I can speak on behalf of our training organisations, which are, are industry-led organisations, and and they are tasked with managing national consistency. And of course, you know we are a small country, but but we have uh, em employers and workplaces of all shapes and sizes up and down the country. And so I think where digital assessment is really helping here is uh, in terms of both the online delivery, particularly of work-based learning, that we can be collecting that evidence in a more centralized way so that, that we in turn can be telling the regulators about whether or not industry standards are truly being met. So I think the answer is yes, we're less reliant on people moving around, checking in different regions and different employers. And we are actually able to see in a more of a, a big data way, or at least a medium data way, whether or not actually standards are genuinely being met to maintain standards across an industry. Thank you. Uh, now we will move to uh, our next uh, uh, international speaker. Uh, Dr. Patrick Watt. Uh, Dr. Patrick is the head of the evaluation and research team at Skills Development Scotland, SDS. Prior to joining SDS, he worked for Future, Future Skills Scotland. Patrick was also previously a, a director for a leading Scottish economic development consultancy. He has over 30 years of experience in evaluation and research in Scotland in both the private and public sectors. Patrick has an honor degree in mathematics and statistics, a master in urban 
and regional planning and a PhD in labor uh, economics. Uh, Dr. Patrick will talk today uh, about evaluating apprenticeship in Scotland. So uh, Dr. Patrick, the floor uh, is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. So I thought I'd talk today around how we evaluate and review the apprenticeship family in Scotland. And there are essentially three elements to that family. So there are foundation apprenticeships, which are chosen by secondary school pupils when they're making their subject choices. And it gives them the opportunity to participate in some work-based learning. A few things that are maybe important to note here that the foundation apprenticeships are relatively recent. The Pathfinders were started in 2014 and 2015. They're now part of the senior phase curriculum across schools in Scotland, and they're available in all 32 local authorities in Scotland. And there's parity for foundation apprenticeships alongside academic qualifications like the Scottish hires. And why that's very important is it means that if a young person makes the choice to do a foundation apprenticeship, it doesn't limit any other future choices. So it doesn't preclude them from going to university when they leave school or going to college or indeed entering the world of work and taking up uh, a job or, or an apprenticeship. The second element are the modern apprenticeships and they are much more um, longstanding. There are all modern apprentices are employees and it gives employees the opportunity to secure an industry recognized qualification while still in employment. Thirdly, we have the graduate apprenticeships and they are again, relatively recent. The phase one was in 2017, 2018. They are industry recognized degree level qualifications that are offered in key sectors. So for instance, my son's friend is doing a civil engineering graduate apprenticeship. He works four days a week and one day a week, he attends university to study. And at the end of four years, you'll get a degree level uh, civil engineering qualification. So in terms of the apprenticeship program, Skills Development Scotland publishes regular management information and official statistics on numbers of starts and completers and so on. And, the breakdown of uh, the apprenticeships demographics. And they're all available on the Skills Development Scotland website. In terms of my own team's work, in terms of research and evaluation, it's been a mix of internally delivered and externally commissioned evaluation. And in the last few years, we've had about 40 separate pieces of work. The themes have principally been around the apprentices themselves, how they feel about their apprenticeship, what difference it's made why employers participate and the benefits of participation, and also the other side of that coin, why do some employers not participate? Looking at other stakeholders, such as training providers, thinking about the equality, diversity and inclusion aspects. So is it working equally well for everyone? And then looking at public policy and, and return on investment, and we'll maybe come to that in a minute. So the scope of that work has been slightly different for the ME, the Modern Apprenticeship Programme, than it has been for, say, foundation apprenticeships and graduate apprenticeships. And that's principally because for foundation apprenticeships and graduate apprenticeships, they're relatively recent. So we've done a number of process evaluations, a number of uh, very quick feedback to make sure that as they're designed and as they're launched and rolled out, that that feedback drives continuous improvement. For the Modern Apprenticeship, we've done a lot of work with employers and apprentices to look at their experience and outcomes. And in particular, and I'll touch on this again today, um, issues around uh, well-being in general. In terms of the key results, we do produce a number of reports, again, available on the SDS website and summaries of those reports in the forms of infographics. I won't go through 
this in too much detail, but for foundation apprenticeships, we would say, you know, 86% of those learners are satisfied, 91% would recommend it to others. Employers say that they're involved in foundation apprenticeships to help develop the workforce of the future, to improve the sector's image, and to help uh, with re recruiting and retaining young people. For modern apprenticeships, we're saying that we've got 91% of modern apprentices in training were satisfied and 96% would recommend them to others. For graduate apprenticeships, it's an 83% satisfaction level and 89% would recommend. The foundation apprenticeships, there are 12 frameworks, things like accountancy, engineering, food and drink, finance, um, uh, healthcare and childcare social services. There are about three and a half thousand in the current cohort. For MAs, it's a much bigger program. There are about 35,000 in training and about 28,000 starts last year. For graduate apprenticeships, we have around 1,100 starts, 350 employers and 13 institutions now involved in the program. But much more of those statistics and, and key results are available on the SDS website. And the key pieces of work that we did was to look as well at the well-being of modern apprentices. So as to think, what are the wider impacts of the program? So not just about being in employment and how much you earn, but how does it help you with your personal development, issues about well-being and potential career progression? So we conducted an in-house telephone survey. We contacted over 2,000 modern apprentices. Within 12 months to three years since they'd left training, and we included com both completers, so those who had successfully completed their apprenticeship and those who had failed to complete their apprenticeship. And the results were representative of the ME population and reweighted, as you would expect. And what we found is that modern apprentices reported higher levels of well-being than the general population. And that's in terms of things like satisfaction, happiness, and feeling that life is worthwhile. Modern apprentices in particular sectors like social services and healthcare reported significantly higher scores around feeling that life is worthwhile. And we think there's a key point in there, which is, as we say, it's not just about wages and career progression, that there are different things that people want from jobs. And it's important to recognize that. In terms of the summary of the wellbeing work, it was summed up, someone said, you know, as, as an apprentice, I gained confidence, I gained knowledge, and I gained a qualification. And I think that's a really good summary of the, the benefits of the apprenticeship programme. One of the other things we've been looking at is the importance of bringing in new thinking and links with academia. So my team also runs the collaborative PhD programme, along with the Scottish Graduate School of Social Sciences. How does that work? Well, we advertise some topics that we're interested in as an organization, and then we work with the graduate school to recruit academic supervisors and PhD students to tackle those topics. What's different from a normal PhD is that in a normal PhD, a student has two academic supervisors in a host university. All of our students have that but each of our students also has an SDS sponsor and they link the student into S and the Skills Development Scotland and the wider skills community. So they provide them with access to data. They provide them access to senior networks if they have to do some field work or do some qualitative research. What are the benefits to us? Well, it means that we're plugged into the academic community. We're creating this new group of researchers who understand the Scottish skills and education system because that skills and education system is very different from those in the rest of the UK. It strengthens within our own organisation the value of academic research, academic rigour. It allows us to look at some critical questions in terms of skills policy, skills delivery, careers information advice and guidance, and it produces new research aligned to the evolving skills agenda. So I've included in some of the topics that are in our PhD programme on the right hand side and a link to our brochure where you can find out about all our students. And this year for the first time, we encouraged our students to produce a three minute thesis where they produce a short video talking about the nature of their PhD, 
what questions they're going to tackle and why they think that's important for policy. So this is a really good way of bridging from practice and policy to academia, focusing on impact. In terms of developments, there are a number of things. So we have the education and skills impact framework. So we've done a lot of work on, we've got good management information, we've got good feedback from the apprentices, we've got good feedback from employers and training providers. We've looked at outcomes and short-term outcomes. What are the long-term benefits? What's the impact of this investment from individuals, from employers, and from the public person, the exchequer, into the apprenticeship system? And what, again, is important here is that we're looking at not just at the economic return on investment, but a social return on investment. So we need to look at estimating and capturing the wider non-monetary benefits. The Scottish Government has recently produced some information on earnings for modern apprentices five years after they've completed um, their apprenticeship using a data set in the UK called the Longitudinal Education Outcomes or LEO. So that again is a start to start to think about longer term impact. My own team is looking at streamlining and evaluation and research work. How we do this across what we're calling the apprenticeship family, foundation apprenticeships, graduate apprenticeships and modern apprenticeships. And then how does this help us with our, the impact of COVID-19 and our response? So taking those in turn, I'm not going through this in detail, it is available. Um, we have the education and skills impact framework, and that looks at what information we have on the inputs to the process, the outputs, the, the perception and views of the participants in the programs, what benefits they see, not just in terms of career progression and wages, but uh, social and health and the wider uh, benefits, what the short-term outcomes are, and what the long-term outcomes and impacts are. And that's split around the three groups I mentioned. For the individuals themselves, that is the apprentices, for the employers that participate in the programme, and for the exchequer and society, for the public purse that invests in these programmes. And that work is ongoing at the moment. We're also looking at how we can streamline feedback from the apprentices themselves. We have a financial processing system called FIPS. And what we're keen to do is to say, for each of our apprenticeships, so foundation, modern and graduate, can we capture information from those apprentices very shortly after they start their apprenticeship? So they're in training. What does the training feel like to them? Is it working? What do they think about it? When they leave, can we ask them how, what they've learned, where they're going next, what benefits they've got from the apprenticeship and how much of that is attributable to the apprenticeship itself. And then very shortly after they've left, say 12 or 15 months, where are they now? Has there, has there been career progression? What are they doing? So taking those questions and asking it across the apprenticeship family as a whole. And what we're planning to do is to use that to produce almost real-time reporting data on perceptions to undertake an annual analysis to include key performance indicators, so satisfaction, satisfaction, likelihood to recommend, and to disaggregate that as far as we can while respecting uh, respondents' confidentiality. And then finally, to use this to support further research, looking at longitudinal analysis, people who've gone from a foundation apprenticeship through a modern apprenticeship to a graduate apprenticeship, what was that journey like? And as I say, to look at things like equality, diversity, and inclusion, and to look at groups for whom this is working well and for groups for whom this is working less well. All of those things put together help us in looking at a response to the pandemic. So this is quite fluid at the moment in terms of Skills Development Scotland responding to COVID. We discussions about having an employer recruitment incentive on top of this, but these are the main elements of how we will respond. So providing routes to employment, supporting individuals to train, providing a transition training fund for those who have lost their job and are looking to get back into work very quickly, helping apprentices who lose their job and supporting employers to take on redundant apprentices and help them find new apprenticeships, 
and provide uh, largely through digital means some face-to-face -face support for PACE's partnership uh, and continued employment. So that's to help people who've been made redundant. Now that we have that response, the tools and techniques and training that we have in the team will help us to think about how we capture feedback from these programs very quickly in terms of their design, how to feed continuous improvement. Let's figure out what's working well and where things aren't working well, how we can change them. And all of that evidence will support in the future an independent evaluation of our response to the pandemic. I think that's me just about time. So just to say thank you for inviting me again to speak today. Thank you, Dr. Patrick, for sharing with us this uh, wonderful and amazing experience of uh, uh, skills development to Scotland. Uh, and one of the most important topics in you know, getting people to, uh, to work and improving job seekers' qualifications. Uh, just have one question about you know, maybe apprenticeship is one of the topics that uh, different countries um, uh, have different experience. So how unique is your uh, program and uh, do you, do you uh, compare it with other global uh, you know, programs? And uh, so that's my question about the, you know, from your assessment, uh, how do you look at other countries uh, experience in apprenticeship? Our, one of our directors, uh, Jonathan Clark has worked really closely with the OECD. And in fact, the education and skills impact framework came from some work that we did with the OECD to see is there any is there anything that exists in the world that we can adapt or amend or use so absolutely um, although our system is very different from the other education and skills systems in the UK we are looking to the OECD and others to see where we can learn from thank you very much again we will have uh, more question at the end of, uh, of the session. Uh, we will move to our uh, next speaker, uh, one of our uh, well-known local expert, Mr. Mohammed Al Asiri. Uh, Mohammed is the executive director of the National Center for Training, Evaluation, and Accreditation. Uh, Mr. Al Asiri uh, has more than 20 years of experience in government, private, and non-private sectors, where he has worked with education sectors through a number of international entities, including Cisco Systems, Microsoft, Pearson Education, in addition to a number of local entities. His expertise uh, is focused in strategic transformation, in education sector, ch change management, strategic and operational management. Mr. Asiri worked during the last uh, nine years. Uh, Mr. Asiri worked during the last uh, nine years focused in training and skill issues and uh, bridging the gap between training sector and labor market. He's currently working on building an innovative model for the National Center for Training and Education and Accreditation in partnership with industries and the labor uh, uh, market. Mr. Asiri holds a bachelor degree in management information system, King uh, Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals. Uh, he will be talking today about uh, ATEC uh, evaluation and accreditation approach for the training sector in the Kingdom of Saudi uh, Arabia. Mohammed, uh, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Your Excellency. And I am very honored actually to be speaking today um, in this uh, very important uh, conference. For our international guests, please allow me. I'll be speaking in uh, Arabic and uh, the, the translation, inshallah, will be uh, given to you. Uh, alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you all. May you all have a good evening today. I'm honored to be here in this conference among this, this elite on experts of training and education uh, from uh, the kingdom and from the international uh, realm. I'm going to speak about what we do in the ETEC evaluation accreditation approach in terms of the new ideas that we want to tackle and the ideas that were mentioned today also but by some of the international experts in order to know how do we how we work on these ideas and how we implement them in fact
Our Arabic culture spoke a lot about the importance of work more than the importance of knowing uh, the knowledge itself. In our uh, Arabic culture, we find that knowledge or is when it is accompanied with practice, it gives results. Also our Islamic culture and the culture that we inherited from our Arab uh, forefathers speak about the importance of work, the importance of practicing our knowledge. And we find that in a lot of uh, the sayings and the works that we find in our Arab and Islamic culture. Uh, today, I'm uh, mentioning only one of these quotes, one of the Arab philosophers, a man who does not practice his knowledge is like a leafy tree that does not bear, bear fruit, which is uh, a quote by Abu Hayyan. Now let's speak about what is going on in Saudi Arabia and around the world. After that, we're going to speak about the different points that I'm going to tackle. What we are doing uh, about uh, this job in Saudi Arabia and in our EDEC in terms of developing the mechanisms and the methodologies of evaluation and accreditation in Saudi Arabia. As uh, their excellencies uh, mentioned before me, we are in a country that works in accordance with a vision, an ambitious vision led by uh, the Crown Prince. May Allah protect him in order to develop Saudi Arabia. Development in Saudi Arabia today is uh, usually accompanied with educational development and employment development. There are a lot of things that were mentioned about Saudi Vision 2030, but if we have a deeper look at it, we'll find that it focuses a lot on the impact the transparency as well as partnerships. Another point that I want to mention is that uh, also uh, in terms of all of these changes that we're mentioning in Saudi Arabia and the times that we are uh, facing now in the whole world in terms of change, it is a huge change that we are seeing all over the world. This change that happened uh, by COVID-19 all over the world, a huge change. And if we look at the missing skills in the field of education that was impacting as well, the TV, uh, the educational and vocational systems, it is a huge impact. Uh, there is a waste or a missing of like third of the year or maybe higher than that. So the impact will be huge and the students of, who are now in the grades between 1 and 12, they might expect 3% lower income for their entire life because of this impact for their entire life. As for the nations of the countries, they may lose maybe 1.5% of their annual GDP for the rest of the century. So the educational and training uh, ways of missing that happened has this profound impact. And given that technical and vocational training depends on uh, laboratories, on experience and hands-on training and the real training that was not available for uh, most of the uh, people during and after the crisis. Also the work markets are uh, hugely impacted during and after the crisis. Also another point is that we don't live in isolation. We are part of this world and in this world, there are a number of stereotypes and patterns that are uh, known and common. Some of them are in front of you now that uh, impact us in Saudi Arabia directly. For, for example, the competency-based training that started to spread all over the world. This kind of training and education is uh, in which train, trainees look for not only the number of training, the number of hours of training, but the number of skills. And around the world, we will find, if we look, we'll find that there is a lot more focus on the skills and people are now looking at the skill as if they are looking at the certificate or maybe more important than the certificate. So the technical and vocational accreditation and evaluation if agencies should uh, know how to depend on that uh, related to the skills. Another point is related to the apprenticeship. Apprenticeship as bad 
Patrick has mentioned a while ago, it is one of the most common patterns which is more in demand more than ever before as OECD uh, have clarified and other organizations around the world because TVDC and training in general around the world, if they're going to have a quick comeback, they need apprenticeships Apprenticeships. Apprenticeships are, are important for the recovery of this kind of training in order to uh, recover from the coronavirus uh, problems. Also, it is non-linear career paths that we're witnessing now. Previously, trainees would uh, study for a number of years, then go to the work market. Now, everything is overlapping and it's not linear anymore. Uh, employees are expected, uh, while on the job, uh, they are expected to receive training and to have training and to uplift their skills, to upscale themselves. And now they need to diversify their skills in order to avoid the, the volatility of the work markets and to acquire new experiences and more skills. This requires a good response and a, a huge response from the training uh, delivery services uh, all over the world and service deliverers. And this will be reflected on the accreditation, accreditation and evaluation agencies in order to develop new plans and redevelop their current plans in order to cope with this change in demand. Also in Saudi Arabia, there is another kind related to the Generation Z, Generation Z, which was born after, from 1995 to 2011. They are now the oldest one of them is 25 and the youngest is seven years old, maybe. And now, given that we have 70% of our Saudi citizens are youth, this generation started becoming the generation who is controlling the work market and the workforce. This generation looks at training and education through a different uh, glances, uh, through a different glasses. So they are a generation that is ca more than capable of dealing with technology better than the generations before them. If we look at the flexible work or flexible and or freelancing, Saudi Arabia through a Ministry of Labor and uh, Social Development have issued a number of rules and laws and regulations that will work on developing flexible working and freelancing in order to help people have huge number of skills. These skills are not limited to something specific, but re related to different fields. People will be developed. And now we're speaking about uh, learning for all people, learning for adults, and upscaling the uh, skills of people. People need to have flexible work, flexible skills, and they need to have different alternatives and options. Also another thing related to the micro-credentials and the nano and micro credentials are very important. And trainees are not now not sitting on the seats for long hours. Even employment agencies now require trainees before they finish their training and quicker than before because now they have economic, quick, rapid economic requirements and they need trainees to be quickly available for the workplace or the work environment. So these current demand uh, puts pressure on the training agencies and the accreditation agencies as well. Through these changes, we wanted to work in order to develop our internal methodologies in addition to looking at the international global best practices and trends. The first part, which is a part that is uh, common between all of agencies around the world, industries and sectoral councils play an integral role in the development of standards, which is an integral part to the accreditation process in terms of building standards, as well as the actual participation in the accreditation and evaluation processes. Another point which is very important, and uh, Mr. Williams has focused on in his speech when he spoke about the agencies who uh, are responsible that are responsible for inspections and accreditation. Uh, those who think that it is uh, not easy to be done, as Mr. Williams has mentioned, it is a developmental process. We need to have partnerships with the uh, training agencies in order to have accreditation and evaluation as a participatory process, not just an inspection process, so that it will achieve sustainability and achieve the goals of the uh, development goal that we acquire. 
Another thing that is very important is that governmental funding is respond is related closely related to the to the quality. So it is important for Saudi Arabia also to take care of that. And the countries who provide this kind of support should have the right to uh, receive some kind of quality. And this level of quality should be available. Governmental funding can be an incentive towards quality. So what did we do? We looked at these different variables and different aspects, and we uh, took advantage of the period of the COVID-19 crisis to reconsider our uh, model in general. The model that we have or the system is as follows. First, we should tackle the standards and look the standards. We should review our standards. These standards, are they focusing on the inputs or the outputs? We found that our main focus was on the inputs and the processes, but the impact that needs to be done was to have more focus on the outputs, to have uh, more freedom for the agencies of training in order to reach the best impact with their own way, if they have other ways or better ways to uh, use. In other uh, sectors, they have diff different ways. Another thing that the training sector, because it's diversity, because of its diversity and other SMEs and big projects and medium uh, companies, they may need an accreditation, accreditation process that is uh, composed of more than one phase. So we have three phases of accreditation. The first one is, as mentioned by Williams, a phase of self-assessment. This self-assessment phase is very important. In this phase, we made it composed of an electronic system. This electronic system uh, will be good. We will not bother the agencies. We will not annoy them. They will work 24 hours, 24-7. Uh, they can uh, do their self-assessment uh, around the clock. Also, there is an electronic society that will help the uh, officials of these quality agencies to have peer-to-peer -peer knowledge transfer in order to uh, have the maximum advantage. We don't intervene in any of their work. We don't interfere. We make this system available. We set the skills, make them ready. They can freely work and they can get over the fear of self-assessment. They can self-assess their own work and they can uh, tell us when they are ready for accreditation and evaluation. We use technology and we found that a lot of the automation can be done for the evaluation process. And we benefited a lot, all praise due to Allah, because of this uh, journey that we, uh, or this period that, uh, in which we received more, num larger numbers of agencies and all sectors of Saudi Arabia that started adopting technology. Now we reached about 75% of automation of uh, our organizations, and we hope that we will reach more than 80 to 90% in the near future. Also, we look at the reviewers and the community, and we say that we need to have a new approach to qualify the li and licensing reviewers. We sent a lot of invitations. We communicated directly with many practitioners in the industries and in factories and oil and gas sectors. In all sectors, we asked them to be a part of our reviewers, and we gave them a number of workshops in order to help them know the mechanisms of accreditation and evaluation to be members of our teams. And I commend a lot the work that was done in partnership with many agencies and stakeholders, starting with His Excellency Dr. Ahmed al fahed and his esteemed team for their active participation in building the accreditation and evaluation standards they were our partners since day one. And this development of the platforms was not in separation from the agencies. We had them uh, engaged with us, and this development was according to what they desired and what they expected. Here is a brief look on one of the platforms, which is the uh, National Observatory or Al Marqab Al Watani. Uh, and we have now seven versions. Each version is related to the feedback of the training sectors, uh, whether medium or big or SMEs. And also we worked with the Ministry of Social Development and Labor, also uh, the Human Resources Development Fund, 
because HRDF wants this platform to be connected to the other platform related to the training situation in Saudi Arabia. We also wanted these uh, all of the stakeholders to have better uh, effectiveness. And during the coming two weeks, we will uh, launch the eighth version of this platform uh, based on the change we received in the feedback of the uh, em employers. employers. Uh, this is a link you can uh, follow to find uh, more information. If you, have any, if you have any questions as well, you will find the Q&A uh, uh, division in the website. You have three minutes. OK. As for uh, the program accreditation system, we found that the best way to uh, do it is through, through working with the sector agencies and stakeholders. We talk to many ministries in Saudi Arabia who organize and uh, work in different industries in Saudi Arabia, and they were very interested in being a part of the team who will build the programming accreditation system. And we will help them in terms of the technical issues related to these standards. But those agencies and uh, sectorial councils will work on the technical parts related to their own work, whether in telecommunication or other sectors. We also found that using technology may help and facilitate this work in partnership with them. Those agencies will have direct access to the platforms of the uh, corporation. Also, the subject matter experts will be uh, responsible for helping us a lot in terms of setting the requirements and the demands of their own sector in order to have the core of the skills that will be required for each learner or trainee. We also found that many of them are interested and we worked with them and soon we will train them on this field uh, in order for them to be fully ready. Today I have my colleague Dr. Abir. She uh, works with her team in order to develop the a new programming accreditation system, and we will work with other, all other uh, agencies like TVTC and the Ministry of Human Resources and uh, HRDF, in addition to many more of the agencies of the industrial section. What I want to say uh, at the, is that at the end of the day, we want it to be participatory process in partnership with the stakeholders, and this will help us achieve greater results. We look forward to more partnerships in Saudi Arabia as a factor of success. This success factor will help us uh, achieve our uh, goals and uh, tackle our responsibilities. The decision makers, the trainees, the parents, the students, all of those should be engaged. And up to now, our experience is very good, but I can say excellent with all of the people who, are, where, who we worked with. We look forward to receive the results of this um, work in the quarter in the fourth quarter of 2020 and to start the new year thank you dr muhammad for your presentation uh, it is a great effort that you are doing in the corporation and uh, in your center in this field as you mentioned it is very important to benefit from uh, what is happening uh, that there is a lot of digitalization automation happening now in saudi arabia i have a, one question related to this huge change that is happening in the market. How do you deal with that situation? And how uh, do you uh, tackle the new requirements and demands by the training corporations? How do you facilitate their work? I know that every, this will benefit everybody, but how do you deal with their demands? Uh, thank you for your question. We take their feedback and we put it in front of us as an investment, not as an in inspection. When we invest in the accreditation and evaluation process, we find a lot of developmental areas and improvement areas that needs to be worked on. Another thing that we connect the accreditation and evaluation process to the results and the outputs and the advantages that we have in Saudi Arabia, whether in terms of support, in terms of the act, uh, right to have access uh, or to many of the governmental uh, business opportunities. So this will have greater opportunities for the agencies, their representatives, and for all of us. This will be more beneficial than having pressure or putting pressure of inspection on them. We need them to work with us. Thank you very much. At the and the conclusion of these six presentations that were delivered, all of them 
were wonderful and i'd like to thank the speakers for uh committing to the time allocated for all of them now we will move to the questions from the audience i have a number of questions and i'd like to ask uh, to direct them to the speakers and if any of the speakers wants to uh, add anything they can uh, uh, freely let me know before the question i'd like to thank his excellency the head of the board of directors of tvt PC and EDEC, Dr. Ahmed Isa and Dr. Hussam Zaman, and the team worked for their great efforts in organizing this conference for choosing the elite of experts that we are having now. Thank you very much. Uh, the first question is for Dr. Ahmed al fahid Dr. Ahmed, here I have a number of questions. I will mention all of them and you can answer all of them. First, how the TVTC sector, how do you see your important role in uh, shaping the skills of different levels of education and uh, how do you help citizens get in the system of institutions? Another question, what is the sense, the, uh, what is the driver for qualification? Is there a weakness in qualification or are there new demands for more qualification? This can be a general question for all speakers, but I also mention it to you, Dr. Ahmed. How can we have self-assessment and external assessment? How can they go in line or hand by hand to achieve results? Self-assessment and external assessment. Dr. Ahmed, you can start answering now. Thank you very much, doctor. And thank, I'd like to thank the uh, those who asked the questions. First of all, I'd like to speak about the uh, World Economic Forum. They mentioned a lot of skills and a lot of jobs that will require new skills. And also the digitalization of the labor market. The labor market will be digitalized. And uh, that's why there are jobs that will expire and there are new jobs that will emerge. So they talked about that there is a need for requalification in order to keep up with the new requirements of the labor market also related to the role of the uh, corporation of course uh, if we have better training and vocational education uh, early enough in the journey of the people it will be better in terms of results we have programs like utkin this these programs are social and they're important uh, saudi citizens males and females they can start uh, enrolling to these programs from early ages they are providing them uh, with skills uh, that they need uh, also in terms of uh, national festivals like al jinadri and others we have different academies for uh, children within these festivals in order to uh, help students achieve their own skills and we give them uh, uh, encouraging certificates if they uh, learn some of these skills we also want to en enlist some of the workshops uh, within the curricula and schools in order to get students to know some information about some skills these are some things that we do but i'd like to confirm that uh, also related to the skills required for the future this is a difficult question to be answered now uh, but all countries work on skills forecasting because training and evaluation requires a lot of curricula and standards for qualification and train the trainers programs we need preparations and forecasting the future skills is very important and this will require us to have greater connects to different opportunities and different partnerships we started uh, we launched two technical colleges recently and uh, big companies in Saudi Arabia like Saudi uh, telecommunication companies Saudi the advanced uh, electronic systems uh, most of them like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, they are participating in the board of directors of these colleges. They know much about the future skills and the programs required for the future. So the standards that we need to enlist uh, are important and we receive them from them. These are some of the things that we are working on. Thank you, Your Excellency. I have some questions for Dr. For Dr. Ahmed Zahrari, but it can be also answered by any of our speakers. What are the most important or required specializations for 
the labor market from 20 to 20 from 2020 to 2025 and what are the most uh, the best paying jobs in this period and the speaker speaking in english Uh, to the whole journey of the learner. Uh, another uh, question, uh, I think it's duplicate question, the same question. So Ahmed, um, Dr. Ahmed, can you answer the questions? Shukran, Malik. In terms of the question, first, what is the most important teacher and the teacher to the year 25? Thank you, Your Excellency. As for the uh, most required uh, jobs from 2020 to 2025, I think uh, labor market is dynamic and uh, specialization is important, uh, but linking some kind of specialization to specific jobs will be uh, misleading. Labor market focuses much on skills and performance more than the academic uh, titling of specialization. But generally speaking, usually technical uh, specialization like finance, telecommunication pay uh, better uh, salaries than other jobs this is a general speak, generally speaking another question was related to uh, the national consensus i think that there is no need for national consensus and this is what we uh, depended on, on our strategy so in order to give a full answer regarding the uh, demand of the private sector related to the uh, skills but generally speaking in our labor market strategy we started an initiative that will get all the related parties together to have a look on the mechanism of training the required skills according to uh, the sectors and the jobs also now we are working on the skill survey we call it skill survey in cooperation with hrdf human resources development fund and the, uh, the, the etec as well uh, regarding the skill survey and uh, what we are required to prepare for the future also the a skill tag that we have in order to prepare for the labor market and what is required for the companies. We analyze a lot of the uh, demands for jobs on LinkedIn and other platforms nationally and internationally, and we found that there is a huge growth on, in terms of the demand on skills of digitalization, uh, problem solving, and cre creative thinking skills. These are new skills that are emerging, growing, and are being important, focusing on the skill and how to develop them, how to keep up with the change. This is a very important and considerable thing to find for uh, an employee. Uh, could you please elaborate on the linkage between uh, a, f a framework of skills recognition and a framework of co qualifications? What is the trend noticed regarding the role uh, of uh, role of skills in the qualification making? Are we moving toward uh, distributed skill skills recognition leading to qualification recognition? Another question uh, for you uh, also. Uh, uh, you, uh, it seems that the development of uh, uh, NQFs is not the end of the story. It may be easy uh, part uh, to do to to compare uh, the implementation of uh, NQFs. Would you please uh, shed some lights in the implementation phase, particularly that ATEC is planning the implementation phase? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, so as I said, uh, we are providing a lot of support for the uh, development implementation of NQF to uh, many countries, uh, to many uh, developing countries. And uh, we know the good practices of the NQF, but uh, most of those practices uh, are in the uh, wealthy country, OECD member countries. And in the developing countries, I think many of our partner countries, I think they are still under the development. And uh, we understand that uh, this is this requires the uh, uh, broad stakeholder, uh, broad consultation with various stakeholders will be needed. And also a, a very strong commitment, uh, political commitment is necessary. And uh, 
uh, yes, I don't really have a clear answer, but uh, this is still an ongoing process. And uh, for example, one of my uh, recent experience is I am the coordinator of the, uh, the big Tibet project in Uzbekistan. And the uh, government has a kind of outline of the qualifications framework, but uh, it has not yet completely uh, implemented. And uh, we are providing support for the capacity development on agricultural Tibet. And we are trying to incorporate some new ideas to the agricultural sectors, like the uh, use of big data, the use of drone, and also the use of the uh, uh, you, you know agriculture without using soil, like uh, aquaponic, hydroponic, those kind of new technologies. And uh, of course, there is an implication to the qualifications framework. So we are working with the international qualification expert and uh, try to introduce some of those th these new ideas into the ongoing debate of the qualifications framework in the country of Uzbekistan. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think I answered that question, but uh, I, I think this is uh, so, uh, about what we, are do, what, what, what we are doing now. So again, I think the uh, uh, consultation with the uh, broad stakeholders will be needed and, and also the very strong commitment of the government will be needed uh, from our point of view. I, I, I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think you answered it. And uh, this is not my question. This is a viewer's question. So, um, another question that uh, uh, directed to uh, Mr. Uh, Williams. There is a, a tendency to move to the current traditional assessment practices into the digital space without many educational improvements. What's your experience in mitigating such risky tendency, if risky at all? Uh, no, I think that's very real and a very good point. Uh, thank you for the question. I think uh, it's a it's an improving space. I mean, as uh, internet technologies and, and digital technologies have come into play with assessment, I think there was a tendency in the first few years to largely turn paper into pixels and kind of continue with some of the uh, well, tried and true or reliable and, and valid assessment methods. But actually, as I, I think one of the points that I was trying to make in my remarks was that thankfully with the use of the technologies that we can actually get more direct access to where the skills and training action is taking place through capturing uh, actual digital evidence of skill development and skill demonstration. So I think now it is becoming more real time, which is really important when we're talking about augmentation and, and small credentials or, or refresher type training, where we are able to use the technology just to do the small piece, because I think uh, you know, pre-digital things are necessarily a lot more large or less, less granular. So I think it is becoming a more iterative process and there are cleverer uses of the digital technologies today than, than certainly there was previously. Thank you. There's another question. I think it's directed for you also. Indeed, the e-portfolio has begun to make significant uh, intrudes into validation, learning, and skills. However, there are many challenges, including understanding what portfolios uh, present, how to create one, what to include. From your experience, how can we overcome these challenges? How can we shift the concept of telling what I learned to showing what I learned? Yeah, thank you. Um, and again, that's a problem that's shared. I think one of the things that we've seen is the development of a number of these kinds of uh, e-portfolio systems and whether or not one gets critical mass in the market overall or whether it's something that's top down led by government. So I think what's important is that the, the demand side, particularly the employer or the next employer trusts the information. So, you know, I think there's a real role for the, actually for the private sector in here in terms of uh, industry associations, et cetera. So when we look at things like skills, passports and things that are recognized, that we don't end up confusing employers with a, with a fragmentation of lots and lots of different kinds of portfolios so that the employer doesn't necessarily have a clear understanding of the skills and outcomes that underpin that. So I think I wouldn't necessarily argue it has to be just one one system, I think that's I think that's too. Uh, I don't think that provides enough 
diversity to meet the, the needs of different industries which have different drivers. But I think there's an industry by industry conversation to be had about how skills can be demonstrated electronically through portfolios in a way that, as I say, improves on uh, just the old piece of paper qualification. Thank you. Uh, I think we covered all the questions. There are only one question and uh, uh, how the self-assessment and external assessment can work together. That's one question. Uh, I'm not sure if we answered. Uh, and also I want to, Dr. Patrick, to comment, uh, if he, uh, to comment on any of the uh, uh, earlier questions. Yeah, happy to. And, and I think just the question on what skills are needed in the future, I think uh, digital skills, absolutely. And in Scotland, we're looking at meta skills, which would include self-management, social intelligence, working with others and innovation. So as the, you know, picking up things like creativity and critical thinking. So, we, you know, we're starting to look at how can you embed them in qualifications. Digital is going to become um, pervasive digital skills, but this idea of meta skills, working with others, managing yourself, and and being innovative and creative, we think are, are, are softer skills that will become much more important. Thank you. Um, I have a question, Mohandis uh, Muhammad Asiri. فكرة المجالس القطاعية مميزة. هل هناك جهود لانطلاقها؟ ما الأثار الإيجابية المتوقعة على سوق العمل؟ في الحقيقة إنه يعني يعني Maybe the PVTT is not the agency required for or uh, responsible for uh, regulation, but these are some of the things that the Ministry of Human Resources is working upon now. But when we have any kind of work in Saudi Arabia and any kind of agencies can apply for the agencies and for the accreditation agencies uh, and this kind of application cannot be a justification for delivering training or for accreditation and evaluation but the idea of conformity between the needs of the labor market and the requirements for training will be happening because uh, these sectoral councils are important to us in Saudi Arabia and it is not available now uh, in an effective way, and we ask Allah the Almighty that it will be ready soon in order to cover a huge part of uh, the work that we need in order to do our job the right way. Thank you. And external evaluations of apprenticeship, feedback into the decision making and implementation. Is there a regular process to adopt programs and policies based on evaluations? Absolutely. So the point of doing the work is to feed back. And as I say, two things. One is to celebrate success. So identify what we're doing well, keep doing what you're doing well, and to identify areas for improvement. So for the foundation apprenticeships and the graduate apprenticeship programs, there was an extensive uh, review of the pilots and regular feedback. And as I mentioned in my presentation, we're looking at ways of capturing that across the apprenticeship family in future so that we can get almost real-time feedback from the apprentices themselves and feed that into the decision-making process. Thank you. We have all the questions. In the end of the meeting, I want to thank you. We covered all the questions, and at the end of this session, I'd like to thank all the speakers for their uh, wonderful presentations and for the information that they have provided us with. I'd like also to thank His Excellency uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Isa, the head of the board of directors of the corporation, and Dr. Hassan Zaman, the president of the corporation. I'd like to thank all the team for this uh, present for the organization of the conference and the good choice of speakers and topics. Thank you very much, and I'd like to thank all those who participated with us, the audience, whether here or behind the screens. Thank you very much. <laughs>